In our recent video about the most incompetent officers within the Empire, we talked about how for every one competent officer there is, there are roughly three more sabotaging the Empire with their stupidity, greed, and ambition. In today's video, we'll be covering those competent individuals. Hopefully this will give you a glimpse of what the Empire could have been if it wasn't run by a mad evil wizard and his paranoid sycophantic backstabbing underlings. General Maximilian Beers was a towering man at six foot four. He had risen through the ranks of the Imperial Army through skill, cunning, determination, and also a bit of luck. He had been assigned on the Death Star Battle Station, but was absent when it was destroyed. This event also took out many of his superiors. Maximilian Beers would prove himself in more than a dozen different battles in the earlier years of the Galactic Civil War. He was a brilliant ground warfare tactician and would not hesitate to put himself on the front lines. Not for blind glory, but to better see the battlefield and lead the vanguard through weaker positions in the enemy's front lines. One could argue that General Veers was the Ermin Rommel of the Imperial Army's Armored Corps. General Veers would eventually be assigned to Darth Vader's Death Squadron and would personally lead the Sith Lord's ground forces. On one occasion, Admiral Kendall Ozzel and General Veers were invited to Vader's castle on Mustafar. They found the Dark Lord standing at a viewing platform looking over the molten planet. Also, who lacked patience and tact as usual, blurred out how the rebels were vermin and asked Vader how he would eliminate them. Veers would interrupt and tell Ozzel that he was mistaken and that the rebels were weeds and that the Empire was like a storm, powerful but incapable of rooting out their enemies. What Veers was proposing was massive reforms to the Imperial military, a bold request to a Sith Lord who was known to kill officers for just the slightest transgressions. But Vader instead tells Veers that he had made an interesting point, which is a win in itself. Who knows how different the Imperial ground forces would have looked like if someone like Veers was in charge. Perhaps you would see smaller commando units that were better suited for fighting the asymmetrical warfare that the rebel guerrillas like to use. Mithra Nerodo, or Thrawn, was probably one of the most brilliant military commanders the galaxy had ever seen. His analytical abilities are so heightened, it makes me wonder if he's a savant of some type. Even amongst his own people, the Chiss, who were brilliant in calculating, Thrawn clearly stood out. The Chiss' territory was located in the Unknown Region, an exceptionally chaotic area of the galaxy where normal hyperspace travel was extremely dangerous because of the high concentration of gravitational anomalies. Only the toughest and craftiest species could survive in this area of space, and not even the mighty Chiss knew what exactly was waiting for them just a few jumps away from their own home territory. And so young commanders like Thrawn had to be prepared to encounter all sorts of unknown species with unknown military capabilities and intent. Which is why the Chiss Expansionary Defense Force's first contact protocol usually involved officers observing uh, new species from the safety of their cloaked ship. This was a rule that Thrawn oftentimes ignored though. Not because he was arrogant or seeking glory, but because he was able to read combat situations with such clarity, they often knew how exactly to act. And he always trusted in his own intuition rather than follow the rules created by the Chiss hierarchy. Thrawn was a student of culture. He had a firm belief that he could perceive the tactical and strategic intentions of new alien species solely by observing their culture. Therefore, Thrawn had a massive collection of alien artifacts, manuscripts, and other cultural items that he would decipher in order to predict the movements of his enemies. And so, in most battles against uh, new alien species, Thrawn was a few steps ahead. He was able to translate those cultural tendencies into battlefield tactics somehow. But like all savants, Thrawn did have deficiencies elsewhere, including his inability to understand politics. And politics, unfortunately, in the Chiss Ascendancy meant a lot, especially amongst the bickering ruling families that basically controlled everything. Thrawn's successes eventually drew too much ire from the more conservative elements of Chiss society, and so the talented commander would have to go into exile on a decades-long mission to learn more about lesser space, or what everyone else knows as the rest of the Star Wars galaxy. Luckily for Emperor Palpatine, Thrawn would choose to become an officer in his mighty Imperial Navy. Even the extremely human-centric officer corps in the Empire had to tolerate Thrawn's presence. Thrawn's two most important contributions to the Empire would be the design of the Advanced TIE Defender Program. This elite starfighter would have turned the tide against the Rebel Alliance. Unfortunately, once again, Thrawn did not have the political skills to gather enough resources or political support for that program, and instead, a lot of the funding that was supposed to go to his program went to the Death Star. 
Thrawn's second contribution would be his vicious campaign against the Lothal rebel movement. He was able to destroy a good portion of the rebel fleet at the Battle of Atalon, and managed to almost destroy the entire Lothal resistance, but was waylaid by a gigantic fleet of space whales. Not even Thrawn could overcome the most powerful force in the entire galaxy, and that is, of course, plot armor. Cassio Tag was born into an extremely wealthy family, owners of Tag Corporations. When Emperor Palpatine transitioned the Republic into the Galactic Empire, he didn't just do it through force with his clone army. There were plenty of powerful individuals and families in the galaxy that he still had to do backroom deals with to ensure that the transition was as peaceful as possible. See, even the most autocratic dictators have to answer to other people. Cassio Tag was the chief of the Imperial Army and a member of the Joint Chiefs. He basically ran the day-to-day -day operations of the Imperial Army and only answered to Palpatine himself. But as a member of the Joint Chiefs Advisory Board, he also advised the Emperor on military-related matters. Cassio Tag was a thick and powerful individual. He was perceived to be quite unimaginative by his enemies in the Navy. In a way, he was considered the stereotypical army commander. In a galaxy where ground forces were becoming more and more obsolete thanks to the Imperial Navy's growing power and ability to basically bombard everyone into submission. A lot of the elites in the Imperial Navy, which basically had zero battle experience, believed that the uh, army grunt was no longer necessary and their battleships could basically defeat enemies from orbit using the turbo lasers. Sounds kind of familiar. Of course, they were wrong. The reality was, Cassio Tag was actually a very pragmatic and modern military officer. He knew the importance of gathering data, analyzing that data, and applying it to uh, reform in, within the military. He was one of the only individuals on the Joint Chief Advisory Board smart enough or brave enough to announce that he believed the Rebel Alliance was a dangerous threat to the Empire, and more importantly, the Death Star. Cassio Tag hated the Death Star. He would call it Tarkin's folly, and he would constantly butt heads with the Grand Moff, and also the uh, leader of the Navy, who was Admiral Conan Modi. Cassio Tag would be rewarded by Emperor Palpatine for his accurate prediction of what would happen to the Death Star. The Major General would be promoted to Grand General and Supreme Commander of the Imperial Armed Forces. He would have control over the Grand Strategy for pursuing the Rebels, as the Second Death Star was being constructed. The Grand General, however, had to work very closely with Darth Vader, which proved to be his ultimate downfall. Garrick Versio was the main architect behind the plan to make his home planet, Vardos, a part of the Empire. It was one of the many worlds in the core regions of the galaxy that enjoyed a great deal of success and economic growth because of Emperor Palpatine's empire. Prior to joining the Empire, Vardos was an extremely poor backwards planet with very little access and security elements based onto it. After it joined the Empire, it would eventually become known as a utopian imperial world. It was basically an example for the rest of the galaxy to see. Garrick Versio would rise through the ranks of the Imperial Security Bureau and reach the rank of Admiral in the late stages of the war. He was an extremely ruthless and capable commander. He would be sent by Emperor Palpatine to chase down some of the most dangerous rebel cells in the galaxy. Admiral Versio would also be the mastermind behind the establishment of Inferno Squad, a direct action special forces unit that was designed specifically to counter the type of asymmetrical threat that the Empire was facing. At Admiral Versio had been given more resources to train more of these units, which specialized not only in commando tactics, but also going deep undercover and infiltrating rebel cells, the war could have gone very differently. Unfortunately for Admiral Versio, Inferno Squad would defect after witnessing Palpatine's horrendous Operation Cinder plan. This is a part of Emperor Palpatine's larger contingency plan, which included a scorched earth policy that targeted several loyal Imperial worlds, including Vardos. The Death Star program, in many ways, was sort of like the Operation Barbosa of the Empire. It was completely unnecessary, it consumed far too many resources, and it used too many of the Empire's finest soldiers and officers. But from a construction point of view, the Death Star was perhaps one of the most ambitious and extraordinary projects ever carried out by any faction in the galaxy. The sheer amount of moving parts, resources, different factions, and corporations that were involved in this project are simply mind-blowing. The Empire essentially built a moon, a moon that housed the massive city inside of it that was surrounding one of the most powerful weapons ever built. And all of this had to be done without anyone else in the wider galaxy knowing about it. 
And so the Death Star in its early stages was built in small pieces, with individual research teams and departments developing a portion of the larger station. Many of these scientists and engineers had no idea what they were working on. Many of the shipping companies who were moving supplies for the construction site had no idea what the materials were for. And in charge of everything was the brilliant director Orson Krennic. Not only did he manage to get the Death Star built without most of the galaxy knowing, most. What kind of weapon? A planet killer! He also managed to meet most of the different deadlines set before him. Most. In any other faction or corporation outside of the Galactic Empire, someone like director Orson Krennic would be highly sought after for his project managing abilities. He's a focused and organized individual who has enough technical knowledge to hire the right specialists, and he's also a psychopath who is willing to use any tool possible to manipulate and coerce people into getting the job done right. Because, you know, if he doesn't meet that deadline, he gets choked. Not in like an enjoyable or a sensual way. Even if the individual doing the choking is wearing a mask and uh, covered in a leather bodysuit. Orson Krennic ultimately gets destroyed by his own creation, which was stolen by him by one of the most ambitious and probably idiotic Imperials of all time, Moff Will of Tarkin. As a young Imperial cadet, Ray Sloan actually saves the Empire by accident. Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader had arrived on the Defiance Flight Training Institute for inspection over the planet of Christophus. Commandant Pell Balo, an old Republic naval officer who ran that institute, was secretly plotting an assassination of Palpatine. Once they arrived onto his school, he would jump the entire ship straight into a star. Unfortunately for him, Cadet Ray Sloan was sitting at the navigation desk when he put in those hyperspace jump coordinates. Sloan double-checked the bearings and noticed that if she had followed through with the order, the Defiance would have jumped straight into Christophus' Sar Denon. Pell Balo would be retired by Vader permanently for his treacherous actions. See, Ray Sloan, like a lot of good Imperials, um, was born on a planet that was extremely lawless and basically run by spice gangs and slavers. She sought to escape poverty and danger by joining the Empire, and she truly believed in its motto of bringing peace and stability to the wider galaxy. At the age of 30, Ray Sloan would become the captain of her own Imperial-class Star Destroyer, a rarity for such a young officer. And this was before the Death Star wiped out more than a million Imperial personnel. But what really makes her remarkable was that she never really had to be cruel in her position of command, and perhaps that's because uh, her ability and skill gave her a little bit more flexibility. Her service to the Empire was exemplary. Later on in her career, she would thwart another major conspiracy against the Empire being carried out by one of the Empire's efficiency experts known as Count Denitris Vividian. She'd also take part in many of the major battles of the Galactic Civil War. So it wasn't surprising that Ray Sloan would eventually be chosen by Emperor Palpatine's contingency plan to lead the remnants of the Imperial Navy post-Endor. It was beneath her steady guiding hand that the Imperial Remnant would survive its initial foray into the dangerous unknown region of the galaxy. Sienna Ree came from an extremely poor and rural area located on the planet of Jalukin, which was located in the Outer Rim. She found opportunity and purpose in getting entrance into the Imperial Academy, which was no mean feat for a girl with zero prospects. The Imperial military generally recruited more individuals from the core regions of the galaxy. There were simply more slots for them. Still, Sienna Ree was an exceptionally talented pilot and an excellent student. She would rise through the ranks of the Imperial Academy pipeline and eventually be appointed Darth Vader's personal flagship as a TIE fighter pilot. And so began her career in the Empire. She would witness many important moments in Star Wars history, from the capture of the Tantive IV to the destruction of the Death Star at Yavin. Sirena Ree had many friends on board the battle station and vowed to hunt down the rebels who so violently killed her friends. Darth Vader would keep a close eye on Sienna Ree and even transfer the young officer to his Executor class Super Star Destroyer. By the time the Battle of Hoth had started, Sienna Ree was already a part of his bridge crew. During the Battle of Endor, Sienna would lead a squadron of TIE interceptors against the Rebels. She scored many victories that day, but ultimately was unable to prevent an out-of-control A-Wing from flying into the bridge of the Executor, which eventually led to a series of events that destroyed the entire ship. Sienna Ree would survive Endor, but her ship was caught in the shockwave of the destruction of the second Death Star. She would be severely injured by the incident, but the loss of the Executor and most of her shipmates made her only more furious at the Rebellion. 
During the Battle of Jakku, Sienna Ri would actually be promoted to the rank of captain and then be given command of her own Star Destroyer. But during that battle, her ship would be boarded by rebel commandos. Captain Ri would attempt to evacuate her ship and aim to destroy the ship with all the rebels on it. She however would be thwarted by an old friend from her home planet who had defected to the rebellion and she would eventually be arrested by the New Republic. Sienna Ri in many ways was the perfect Imperial officer and she was also a very kind-hearted individual who cared a lot about the people she served with. She understood that the Empire had grown increasingly evil and hostile, especially after the destruction of Alderaan, but the losses she had suffered during the war ultimately blinded her with hatred for the rebels. Like Sienna Ri, Alexander Callus' loyalty to the Empire was hardened early on in his career when his unit was ambushed by a Lassat mercenary working with Saw Gerrera's partisans. He saw his brothers in arms get executed by the partisans one by one. This only made him more loyal to the Empire. A native Coruscant and graduate of the prestigious Royal Imperial Academy, Agent Callus had the intelligence and attitude to be enlisted into the Imperial Security Bureau. The young man was actually personally mentored by Wolf Jolaren, the Clone Wars hero. Callus excelled at using the vast resources of the Empire to hunt down various rebel threats. In individual combat, he was also quite proficient, not only with a blaster, mind you, he also became quite good at wielding a Lassat bow rifle, and he even managed to disarm the fearsome Lassat rebels at Borrelios in melee combat, which is no mean feat given the strength of the Lassat species. But like many competent and intelligent Imperial officers, Agent Callus eventually became disillusioned by the Empire especially once he began to understand what they truly represented. Agent Callus would turn his skills against the Empire and serve as the rebel Agent Fulcrum. Callus was placed in a perfect position to spy on high-ranking individuals like Grand Admiral Thrawn and Moff Wilhuff Tarkin. It was because of Callus's intel that the Rebellion managed to survive several Imperial operations. So, as you can see, uh, the list for competent Imperial officers is a lot shorter, and a lot of these individuals actually end up defecting to the Rebellion, or they ran afoul of Moff Wilhuff Tarkin, or Vader, or Emperor Palpatine himself, which kind of shows you just what kind of direction the Empire was heading, especially after the destruction of Alderaan. They basically lost the ability to make rational decisions on the Grand Campaign. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan and I am really hot right now. It's like 100 degrees. And uh, my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.